Buenas tardes. Estamos hoy en el segundo día. Good afternoon and welcome to day number two of Programa Abierto, Open Program. We've seen a short clip on forest and matter to celebrate the poetic spectrum of trees. Yesterday, yesterday we had the experience in a real forest in La Villa forest. In this edition, four out of the eight works exhibited have been specially adapted for the program, like the video we've seen, which has been edited in 2022 by Martin Charby. Subcortical refers to a botanic concept, meaning underneath the tree's skin, and also a medical concept referring to the structure in the brain where emotions and instinct, as well as dreams, are regulated. The film brings us to the place under the surface in a journey that reveals the fractality of green life. Martin Achari Shaw is an artist and a researcher in new mediums. He holds a BA in fine arts and he is a PhD student in the Basque country. He is in a permanent long life learning and self learning process. He tries and carry out research between digital and physical processes through digitalization and nature transformation processes. The clip that we have seen precedes a conference that will be listening on transitive landscapes, Jorge Teiza and Frank Weisman, a conference by Fernando Moral, and that will focus on the work of the three personalities that reveal the bonds between Europe and the Americas, and fundamentally a very particular conception of mankind and nature as well as landscape, a reflection on intangible values. Fernando Moral is an architect by, the, by, by the University. He holds a master's by the Superior School in Architecture in Barcelona, and he is a PhD, holds a PhD by UOC. He obtained an award by UON, and he works as director of the Architecture School of Nebrija University. He is a member of the Consolidated Research Group on Art and Cities of the Complutense University, and a visiting lecturer of the Sapienza University in Rome. His research has been published in several publishing houses, Live Architecture, Ega, Springa, amongst others. He is the author of Oteguisa, Inhabited in Architecture, Private Space, Public Art. His work as commissioner has been reflected in exhibitions such as the Dutch Mountains, Avalos Anchibit, Six Vertical Landscape, and Eduardo Soto de Moura. He's also been a collaborator of the National Museum, Reina Sofia, and we'll hand it over to him so that he can enlighten us about all these artists. And thank you very much for being here. So I am overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed by the beauty of this place. This morning, I've done a short incursion while the city was asleep. And I've been greatly impacted, phenomenologically speaking. I am overwhelmed by a lot by La Garrocha province. I am less acquainted with the region than I would love. I am a fan of the region from this moment on. And of course, there is no such thing as a presentation without before thanking and acknowledging Andrea and all her team, this amazing auditorium and 
my dear friends, Raphael, Karma and Ramon. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Transitive landscapes in the spot is a reflection that has evolved since I started preparing this disembarkment. Yesterday I was discussing with you all guys in an informal gathering and I believe that I have arrived in a very timely moment. The work of these three personalities has to be understood as an excuse to reflect about the construction of landscape. But life avatars, their lives and mine, have brought us to this happy encounter. But this I would say that landscape is like a multiple and sensitive body charged with mysterious energy and which is and rolls fatally on us. It's the key of our own destiny. To different forms of man, different interpretations of the landscape, different conceptions of the world, different art styles, different resources and different salvation forms. Jorge Otiza arrived to South America in 1935 and stayed there for 13 years and he received not only the impact of exchanging the Basque country by this new continent, but rather a new understanding of what landscape meant. A new understanding that brings us mystically to this picture of Joaquin Torres Garcia, in which a reality of different cultural trends and patterns that have been undermined by the currents that happened in the North or between the North, Western Europe and North America. But there have been other currents and movements that have been inspired by the South Pole that have been inspired and led by the Southern subcontinent that we will hopefully understand a little bit better after today's session. Oteiza in 1944 was in touch with pre-Hispanic cultures of the Cauca and Mandalena rivers in Colombia, two of the main arters. And it's there where he understood and interpreted, and there comes a title, aesthetic interpretation of the American Patrice, published in 1982 about what those places um, hide in their interior. He used to say that he was before a new aesthetic conception preceded by a new vision, the holistic integral landscape. Landscape goes beyond the place. Landscape is more than nature. Landscape is more than the physical environment. And Atesa so understood it, and this is how I try and understand it also. It's a framework for holistic integration. And even I would dare saying more, protagonism is not in nature in this framework. Protagonism is in the society that the framework holds. Atesa tried to build learned landscapes in the Americas, in the Castilian Meseta, in the Montevideo coastline, and of course, in his beloved Cantabric Ocean. In 1954, while he was working in Aranzazu, in the Basilic of Aranzazu, one of the most important projects, of the contemporary culture of the 20th century, he participated in this contest with Jose Luis Romani, amongst other, a chapel in the Santiago pathway, a vet for what it's called a humilladero, which is not a church, but rather a spot where peregrims can stop, reflect, and keep walking down to Santiago. And it was very simple as well as radical. 
a plant in, an, in a U shape where the sculptor materializes several scenes related to the to religion, right? And a cover, which is considered an energetic cover, which is concomitant with the high tension towers that dominated the landscape and that contrasts sharply between the sky and the ground. A clear determination to undermine gravity and to enroot in themselves in a history, the history of the Santiago pathway, and a spot such as this hypothetic landscape conformed by hills. So this project is marked by Science Dorita experience, who in 1948 obtained a grant to study in the US, and it was in the US where he got acquainted with uh, large structures to build air floats and bases. Conrad Bassman obtained or acquired an important meaning in the framework of this project. It was never built. Of course, they won the prize, but the venue was never built. In 1956, the Uruguay government decided to push forward or to celebrate a homage to one of his or the country's statesmen, Oteiza, competed against Roberto Puig, one of the most interesting architects of the 60s and the 70s in Spain. They suggested this very simple operation in terms of shape and very solid in terms of fundaments and ideology. They vet for a prisma that coronates the hill, which is located in the front line, in the Rodeau Park, a line that flies from the hill towards a virtual volume that defines a square, which is 54 meters long. And with this, these three bodies, they solve a contrast control between the topography left by the mining processes of the past and movement defined from an orthogonal and solid approach. Inside the prisma, the program is solved, right? The program defined in the basis of the tender contrast, as I said before, is always clear between what is found and what is projected. And the images here so illustrate the wide prisma is enclosed in its perimeter, and it only opens through a large glass window towards the sky. They used to say, more than thoroughly, that what matters is not the work per se, but rather the active vacuum produced in the hill, a vacuum which is inside the prisma, but also in adjacent areas that are virtually excluded one another with the blocks in this image, mainly because the operation will only make sense when citizens start participating in it. These are empty vacuums awaiting for those who will give them true meaning. Of course, it's a straight to, or yeah, it's a vanguard shape. Of course, we are speaking about a shape that contrasts with the venue that uses a differentiated strategy because architecture is artificial and not natural. But beyond this reflection, I believe it's interesting now that we are alone to listen to what they really wanted to do. And they say, let me quote them, we wanted to be the winners, of course. And when we were appointed winners, we wanted to start a consultation with a pro-monument national 
entity and open a debate about the true destiny of the integrated building within the monument for us a higher institute for research in political and cultural matters a faculty of compared aesthetics studies beyond shape is function and they never built this but Oteiza and Putsch decided back in the 60s to insert in the Mediterranean coast in Mojácar the same operation that had been cancelled in Uruguay and the same operation was hidden under the name Christian Integration Center Johan the 23rd it was never built but they considered that together with all the elements deployed in Montevideo it would be necessary to install a small hotel and apartments for students and professors visiting the center. Even more so, Roberto Puig says meetings will take place and theological, philosophical and social discussions will take place. We are also trying to come up with a university center. It was never built. But we didn't finish here. Oteza and their team were discarded in a project to build a new cemetery in San Sebastián, a project that had been developed with Fuyendo, the architect, and Enrique Arrada, Marta Maiz, and Maria Jesus Muñoz, a proposal with three different options that they considered or that they thought could be displayed as follows in the hill oriented towards the Cantabric Ocean between the two mountains that surround the city, the capital, while they would have a park in the north area and in the southern area, the burials area, all this would be coronated by a square that would define the main occupation and control lines of what they wanted to develop in San Sebastián. And this was the first proposal, the first maquette that they came up with in a few months time with different terraces in the center of the image the square we referred about, and from which one could see the horizon split by a permeable wall with a small group of edifications coronated by the chapel and the different funerary services needed for such a facility. Here is the maquette. We can see a very clear structure and of course this is a replica of the first maquette the different terraces for the death a little park for the living and the square a few days before finishing the project otessa decided to introduce a few adjustments and these minor adjustments turned into a complete cleaning of the project. As you can see, he introduced a small lake to virtually link land and ground and sky, the square for souls to take off towards eternity, and a new prism that could be considered Well, this prisma would contain a chapel and the funerary services and would preserve the main pillar in line with the first proposal, but it didn't last very long because, of course, then there was a third proposal, cleaner, more essential, the square, the prisma, and the lake, which is gone in this new version. 
this new failure also had a hidden weapon in its proposal. They say the north or the south or rather would be for the death and the north for the living since the park that we've seen before would be devoted to a popular university. Once again, we are speaking about a symbolic venue where mankind has to find itself in order to transform society on the basis of an educational project that takes place in a loop. It's quite paradoxical, isn't it? Because back in 1959, Otefa said that he abandoned sculpture in order to enter into life. How did he enter into life? Well, by developing new projects and by continuing some of the projects that he had already announced in the past. And I would like to list a long list of projects that were never, let's say, accomplished. In 1948, he wanted to launch the Arteta Academy in 49 projects for the Hispanic School of Madrid, San Sebastian with a ceramic school, self-funded in 63, International Institute of Contact, Aesthetic, Experimental Icastola Basque School in 66, University of Basque Artists in 69, another school in 79, Sabino Rano Research Center in 89, La Longida Cultural Center. All these projects failed except for the Experimental Art School in Deva. As we've seen, there is a clear priority for narrative, for a speech in his program so that education and pedagogy occupied a clear role hand in hand with metaphysics in his work. And I would like to underline, or at least this is my personal interpretation, that this functionality acquires a superior value. This they were experimental school which survived for a few years, right? As Oteiza and the first promoters defined it, was installed here. Nothing to do with the prisoners and the white bodies. This is the heritage of the Indianos, the Ostalaiza family. This little palace in Deva hosted the university, the Basque University of Art. But it didn't evolve because or what did Oteiza want to do in this little palace? Well, he was concerned because he wanted to make sure that general aesthetics could be taught, split into bodies, objective and existential aesthetics, one focused on ideas, another one focused on ethics, politics, behavior. He considered that there was only one root or origin of knowledge that would allow us to discover the world and only by understanding knowledge could we build a new society. How to set this up humbly? He promoted a few ateliers, architecture, painting, contemporary art, cinema, radio, art, TV, ballet, art and literature, behavioral sciences and even a museum. And these small ateliers were meant to uh, precede a larger deployment, but it never happened. Why did it never happen? And why was he so insisting? Well, for several reasons. I would like to underline one of the reasons before you, a very qualified auditorium, Oteza, considered the world, I mean, he considered the world could not be changed through art, but rather through men and women that art has shaped. This reality goes beyond the physical, formal intervention of artists, right? So that from 
a pedagogical uh, approach, being able to have an impact, transform, and build a new society. Let's now abandon the failed Oteiza because in 1957, he traveled to the Americas again. And this picture is from his first trip to America. That's why the picture is rather poor. That's the best one we've found. And he participated in the fourth Biennale of Sao Paulo or in Sao Paulo. He, he went to the Biennale with 28 sculptors. And he worked with Kandinsky, Montreal, Kandinsky, etc. And he obtained the first award in the Biennale. And that's how he was certified in several documents and in several pictures. There's a formal contrast between clear architectural volumes and this very Baroque work that somehow lays a debate between matter and vacuum and between matter and active vacuum. But since 35 onwards, a lot has changed. A new landscape was built. Oteiza arrived at a time when Brazil is building the mythic Brasilia, where art demonstrations, radical demonstrations, take place in 1956. Experiment number three, the Carvalho, walking down the streets of Sao Paulo. And beyond the contrast in this image, there's a reflection behind on how to set up neo-contemporary art, which is capable of digesting northern influences of European vanguards and the local roots in Brazil. Paulo Jorgenhoff, amongst others, refers to this process to or as anthropophagia. And this is a rather powerful Americas in the construction of contemporary Western culture with names such as Madro, Mario Pedrosa. One of the important geometric art leaders, the director of the Sao Paulo Biennale and the International Association of Art Critics, which promoted the conference in Brazil, the Biennale in Brazil, because he considered that beyond Brasilia, beyond urbanism, beyond the actual buildings, a new social structure was being developed with names such as Cordeiro, Waldemar Cordeiro, IT art leader, promoter of groups such as Rapture and Another name that one needs to bear in mind, Ferreira Goulart, of course, writer, journalist, author of the theory of the no object, which is key to understand special works that those artists in Brazil were developing under the focuses of Rio and Sao Paulo, under the brands of Concrete, Neo Concrete, and others. Ivan Sherpa, founder of the Frente Group, will see the repercussions of his work. Someone who did not only participate in these missions to build or rebuild Brazilian society, but who actively participated in educational programs, such as in the Institute, in the National Psychiatry Institute of Brazil, a Brazil which was ready to host as many influences as possible in order to transform them and redefine them from their own perspective. Max Bill, in the first Sao Paulo Biennale, obtained the Grand Prix with this item. A Max Bill considered the tribute of the different vanguards of the beginning of the 20th century in Europe. And it's the America of the large blocks built blocks like the one we see in this air picture 
in the Ibera Poeta Park in Sao Paulo, blocks like this palace by Niemeyer, mayor who or which was the headquarters of the Pinale of Sao Paulo since 1954, a robust prisma closed, except for the extremes, Rio, the capital had something to say in 1953, this contemporary art project in Santa Lucia Beach with a very simple trace capable of supporting concrete structures, not to speak about Sao Paulo, which is the contrast, the total contrast, Lina Mobardi Art Museum. <clears throat> And all this was promoted by the elites, such as Ashish Atobrian, tycoon of the media, but who Lina considered to be a social project in Sao Paulo that would only make sense when it would also host a popular theater and the esplanade, the square, where different gatherings and visits could take place. A true central square. This proposal is certified or certifies the bonds between Europe and South America, as we can see in this first maquette of the museum by Lina Bobardi from 1951, which is the echo of Mir van der Rohe and who he wanted to, she wanted to build it in Sao Vicente. And this was not only framed in Brazil, this was not only happening in Brazil, of course. This is the project that Niemeyer proposed for the Caracas Modern Art Museum. Once again, we see these lines that resonate to previous images. A radical proposal that wants to stand up on top of a mountain enclosed in its perimeter and robustly open towards the sky. Even though, well, Oteiza only wanted to know one person, to meet one person, Franz Weisman, who was the winner of the best national sculptor in the same Biennale as him, the fourth Biennale. Here in the center, one of his columns coexisting with another artist in the 57 Biennale. Why Franz Beinsmann? Franz Beinsmann from Austria and who migrated to Brazil when he was 11, was a key personality in the development of the culture of contemporary sculpture in Brazil. He was trained in different arts, architecture also, and he became a sculptor in the Polish Agus Samoyski Atelier, especially within a line of figurative uh, sculpture. But as we can see in the image, he abandoned this idea in order to insert himself in the construction of an abstract geometric reality. He conceived a sculptor on the basis of experimentation with different items, combining different elements from or on the basis of praxis and not theory. His atelier was inside a factory, a car factory for a few months in order to make sure that there was direct contact between the work and its production. Franz Beisman was also part of this leader group. He signed the neo-concrete manifesto, dissecting the movement into cities, into focuses, Rio and Sao Paulo. Franz Beisman defined this item, which is considered to be the first constructive Brazilian vanguard work. He considered that the square reflected the beauty archetype and his obsession 
for square shapes, we find an empty vacuum stemming from a process, a construction process to build vacuum through different operations, more or less complex operations, more or less close one to another, more or less virtual. So much so that he considered that shapes or shadows projected by these works or items contributed to the vacuums he was defining. I would like to talk about contrast and reflect about how different artists had reasons to wish to know each other and to coincide. The first line from the beginning of the 50s by Wiseman and the second line, which is ulterior, corresponds to a Taita work. Without now entering into an absurd debate, there is no doubt that there is a certain relationship, a certain formal relationship and a certain conceptual concern. Weizmann participated actively in different contests and public art contests since the beginning of his career. And amongst others, he considered that his work had to grow all the way down from the floor, from the ground with no pillars. He considered that the vacuum has to do with society, more or less complex, more or less diffuse, more or less powerful, more or less infinite. Let's all remember Brancusi's work more or less modulated that somehow looked to build a cosmos within the chaos of urban life. Modulation, the permanent enjoyment of this work was never uh, missing, not even in his most modern work, modulation that somehow brings a certain sense of infinity, brings us to a modular construction on a singular yet open space. And now I would like to share with you an image of one of his works, which was the Modus in 1962. And this has nothing to do with open works. It has nothing to do with metallic works, but it has a lot to do with what he considered public art to be. And let me quote him, art has to be or has to engage people. It's the best way to educate people from the squares, from the streets. Once again, Weisman speaks about items which are not, let's say, an objective per se, but rather one more stop in a complex way of social influence and why not saying it a process to reshape mentality Weisman and Oteiza had a very solid relationship. He was here. He had exhibitions in Madrid in a very convulsed period, emotionally and personally speaking, in a sort of trip around the world, which was complicated for him. But without now entering into this debate, who was him, who was the person who bonded Oteiza and Weisman? There she comes, Lydia Clark, who not for being the end of the relationship between the two previous personalities, well, it doesn't mean he lacks any importance. Lydia Clark is 
Kandinsky in order to understand Western art. Probably he, she suffered the forgiveness of become belonging to the South. But in the last exhibitions in New York, in Bilbao, are rebuilding the reality of what these women projected and developed. Lydia Clark was born in Velo Horizonte. Velo Horizonte is the capital of Minas Gerais. And it's part of the mythics of contemporary construction in Brazil. In Belo Horizonte Art School, chaired by Alberto Darguinia, the main actors of the geometric abstract trends were born, even Franz Weismann. The school started being called the Escola Guinean, and authors such as Caruelas de Castro had a direct contact with the training in these classrooms. Lydia Clark had the privilege of working with Burle Mac, an architect and a landscapist. And in his or in her trips to Paris, she was in touch with Ferdinand de Jean, a key architect and painter who ended up becoming the mentor of the artist. Here is a picture of Lydia Clark in the center of the picture with Madro Pedrosa, members of the lead group founded by Ivan Sherpa with the aim of reshaping contemporary art. Lydia Clark actively participated in the construction of contemporary Brazil. Ferreira Goulart would say regarding the key of this lead group, he would say they are always interested in aesthetic pure manifestation such as primitive painting, the art of the crazy and the art of children. Let's never forget these matters. In 59, Lydia Clark signed the Neo Concrete Manifesto, the radicalization between Radical Art in Rio de Janeiro or in Sao Paulo. William said, and I quote her, geometry, according to the signatories, is a tool to express vital realities. Art cannot be conceived as a machine or as an object, but rather as an almost corpus, which is a being which goes beyond a being that is fractioned by the analysis and only focuses on the phenomena. She began her experience or interaction with painting by getting rid of the frame. She started to understand that the plan can have a larger life or a wider life, as we can see in these lines in this incipient lines, she understood that plants can have an abstract a structure, but at the same time, speaking about a more dynamic and volumetric reality, she created direct lines in the plan that speak about the death of the double dimension in order to reach the The volumetric reality deployed from the plan in a crisis so that it's not a plan anymore or a maquette anymore, but rather a corpus, as Ray Raguillard would say. And of course, this turns into a new burning or a new delivery. As you can see in this image, The figure only depends on those hosting it. Let's now pay attention to this corner, which is so revealing.
En cualquier caso, In any case, Lydia also talked about architecture, about this form of architecture. There's a maquette for a home, which Well, it's not clear if he, she designed it for her. There's a quest for total art. This maquette speaks about painting, about a complete architectonic space, etc. <clears throat> it's about build your own space for living with different panels that can be modified. We speak about architecture, which, as we could say here in this home of the poet, which evokes Le Corbusier. It could be said that there's a contrast, there's a direct and robust contrast, which is with it, with it sculpting structure. Where is the flexibility? pendientes de una aparición definitiva, pero que no se ven compañeros del mismo viaje. Es una etapa speak about the stage where Lydia experiments with match boxes in order to combine experiment in line with what was done by other colleagues like Weinsmann, who understood that art was experimental and who somehow related with the famous lap of a Oteiza, where different attempts happen in order to reach the ideas that levitate in their minds. In this sixth Biennale, she presented the banks, which are so much apart from her architecture, or perhaps not, or perhaps not, because all of a sudden, all of a sudden, fantastic architectures happened. Perhaps the change is not so much for it to appear, right? It looked quite natural, it looks quite natural after so much fighting for real pace. The new element here has to do with the little item here, which is a person and somehow uh, opens a major crisis, a scale crisis. Can we move into a higher scale as to inhabit this space? There's no doubt the answer is yes. Yeah. But in or the capacity to inhabit the space has nothing to do with horizontal architectures asymmetric similarities like Barcelona's Mir van der Rohe pavilion. We're speaking here about gravitatory architecture. And this refers to an architecture which not only threats gravity beyond balance, but also conventional ways to inhabit space. What better idea than bringing fantastic architecture built in 2013 in Henry Moore Foundation that speaks about the different crises we are referring to. This is not so as flexible as we thought, right? Here, the Del Museo animals. And today, by the way, while walking through the museum, I remembered them, right? They speak about how to inhabit a space according to one's own criteria. And there's a direct contrast, right, with what Paul Bellerio said in 1964 regarding the obicus function, how to inhabit, how to live, how to understand the inclined shape, which also belongs to us. It especially belongs to us as individuals inhabiting the world. And of course, 
Lydia also referred to flexibility and he or she rather, uh, she was convinced about the importance of flexibility. It could be even said that this is a self-made item, right? Inherited or the idea of escaping the logics, the volume, and nonetheless, in 1960, she published a text, a paradigmatic text, The Death of Plants. Let me quote her. Its role goes beyond the mathematical, mathematical characteristics in order to end up accepting imposed attributes, even divine attributes. Plants must die because they have stolen humans' role. And the only way to do so is by getting rid of the body that has absorbed it. But in any case, Lydia, in her most recent stages, as we've seen in other authors and architects, abandoned canonic art in order to, let's say, approach art as a direct action discipline. This image, this shamanic image, forces us to understand how the, the, the way she did, right, in different areas, how art as, I mean, art as healing therapy, even shamanic therapy, therapy that brings us to reflect about this jumped from an orthodox atelier towards the atelier of life. He, she never abandoned architecture. Here we have structures which are alive. The thing is that today, even a minor net can be manipulated by any of us. And in it, one can intermingle with any other person in the room. During these years, she did a lot of performance happening and intervention. She created mediating elements between the subject and the perception of the world through the sight, through the smell, through senses, as to come up with a more direct way of understanding life and art. In 1968, she came up with this work. The home is the body. Penetration, ovulation, germination, expulsion, a nominal reflection on the genesis of us all, which can be somehow lived and experienced in this proposal, which back in 2014, as I said before, was developed in New York's MoMA Museum. But architecture is always present with this biological architecture, which underlines the importance of relationships, direct relationships between elements and individuals, which somehow compose this new landscape. Individuals who, as we said before, become the center of her concerns in her final stage, a reality which speaks about a new landscape related to humanity and to what individuals request, right? Beyond shape, beyond physical parameters, there's the direct relationship with people with individuals after this short journey it could be said that landscapes do not exist and what matter are individuals thank you
Bueno, eh, si ahora queréis hacer alguna pregunta, tenéis la oportunidad. So, if, so now it's a perfect time for Q&A. Is there any question? Any... Yeah, questions, comments, concerns. Hola. Hola. Muchas gracias por... Hello, and thank you very much for your presentation. Quite interesting. At the beginning, you said, well, you have shown volumetric Um, you talked about the active vacuum that somehow is configured thanks to the relationship with humanity. And then you showed us work that happens through a plan, which is based on plans. And my perception was once light is introduced into a work, even if it's not architecture, Light is somehow, or well, light is what reshapes the landscape where it's inserted, hmm, something like that. So what is your opinion about the relationship between Weizmann, who for architects somehow, I mean, it really resonates with our discipline not so much the last images you showed to us, Lydia Clark, but Wiseman really resonates on us architects. It's a way to say, okay, architecture is artificial, but if we insert light in it, it stops being artificial. What is your relationship between the limits? Well, thank you very much for this very complex question. Thank you very much for it again. In 1958, Oteiza published the law of change, what he described as the law of change. And there he said that, well, in a nutshell, right? He said, sculptor lose power and it ends up becoming a creative silence. That's what he said. He said that it's needed to build some form of spiritual batteries which can be related with architectonic attempts in landscape, right? I understand that anyone with a minimum degree of sensitivity, when confronted with the landscapes we've seen, are touched, are emotionally touched. And what he suggests is to come up with new landscapes, new ways of understanding landscapes, right? But we've seen how beyond the spots, the places we have seen, beyond light, beyond tangible elements, he says, well, systematically, the three of them speak about individuals, people, and they come up with artificial operations. The last item we've seen from Lydia Clark, the tunnel, where a person was wrapped in a in a sheet was an artificial element but what really matters here is that they speak about functions not about items and of course functions are very architectonic and i believe it's there where perhaps because we live in a very visual culture in a very powerful visual culture. Actually, a few months ago, I was reading about the amount of visual impacts we have on a daily basis. And actually it was such a long figure that it didn't even exist, right? A large figure. So they speak about functions and about the way operations change, but they concern for developing a new society, which again is a function, right? developing a new society is a function. Now, we have a plan, we have a back, we have Weizmann columns, we've got the Christian Integration Center, Jean the 23rd, right? Call it whatever you want. They just redefine their approach as well. They speak about 
transcendent landscapes. No doubt about it. 100% architectonic. No doubt about it. If instead of calling it art, we call it architecture and say that instead of saying Oteza, Weisman, Clark, I say Alto, Le Corbusier, and Mears, probably it would not sound as weird, right? So what I believe is it's important to realize about the power of science and about the power of function, function understood as a real tool for social transformation. This place is, for example, overwhelming, isn't it? It's extremely clean. The materials are very heavy. And the difference between the place this morning and the place now is amazing because today I see it differently because you are here. If we built it in a different stone, it would be the same. What matters is the human gathering that is giving it with a major dimension. And this is a mere function. So I believe it's very important to get rid of the power of shape, the importance of shape. Shape doesn't really matter anymore. It's all about shape. It's Sorry, it's all about the function, which is not only responding to basic human needs or canonic human needs, such as sleeping, eating, etc., but rather a function that can become transcendental and be really socially transformative. I'm not sure I've answered to your question, but thank you very much. In any case, thank you. So, is there any other comment or question? Yeah, perfect. Off you go. First of all, I would like to thank you for the conference. I really enjoyed your presentation. I didn't know, I only knew Oteiza, not the other two artists. The presentation has been very interesting and the images were lovely. So my comment here is, well, I would like to go back to a sentence you quoted from Oteiza. Something like, art does not really change the world, but rather the artist contributes to changing the world. You said something like that, right? So it's only men and women who can really change the world, not art. So this idea, do you think, I mean, do you think this is the reason why he was so much interested in building a university, setting up a university? Do you think that it's because he, as an artist, felt art as being extremely transformative and hence his interest in setting up art centers? Thank you very much. Ramon, thank you very much for the for the question. I would say that it's all about nuances. He says it's not the artist who transformed the world, but any person who's been transformed by art. Not artists, anyone transformed by art. Oteiza does not consider him to be the depository of pre-Columbine wisdom. Not at all. Well, sometimes he did, right? And here I would like to define a culture from a very, let's say, wide approach, as well as landscape. Landscape is a framework. Even if we have forests, landscapes are not only forests or climate landscape are a matrix where we all live, something like that. So this is real change. If art evolves into education, which is 
received by a social group, only then will art bring us to transform society. This is very simple. Politics are important or is important. And it could be said that this is a political gathering because we are speaking about transformation, social transformation. And social transformation will not happen unless we go back to the roots. Of course, education is the roots. If general aesthetics can be deployed in certain educational projects, well, only then those who have been educated in this matrix will understand the world differently and will contribute to changing the world according to what they have learned. And all this is aligned with what I said about Madro Pedrosa. Well, we've always seen Brasilia as a large, risky work, piece of architecture. Of course, many adjectives have been used in the celebration of Brasilia's construction, but he aspired Brasilia to host a new social structure. It's all about social order, call it whatever you like. And again, education does not necessarily mean counting on new artists, but rather new sensitivities before the world reality. And as I said before, if these three different levels were only two, we would be comfortable. Have we transformed the skyline? Yes, we have. But hey, does it really matter if we have three floors or two? Not really. What can be taught here will be disseminated differently. And I'm not saying that this presentation is at the same level as his, right? But again, it's all about what we do with what we have. Because at the end of the day, it's people who do things. Things do not happen naturally. Things are activated by engines, and we are all engines. Well, uh, compared to you, I know very little, but I would say that for those who do not know Oteiza, well, there's something that really interests me about Oteiza's work, which is the quest for active emptiness or vacuum, Oteiza started producing figurative art and little by little he got rid of all the figurative elements and turned into abstraction and little by little he started working on vacuum so he ended up working on a total empty or a total vacuum and it was then when he decided to leave or abandon his creative, let's say, contribution. Could you perhaps tell us a little bit more about this? Because at the end of the architecture, right? When we speak about active vacuum, well, this could be more easily understood because we activate space as architects and thus we can feel whether we are hosted or not in an spatial dimension in a place. So when it comes to sculpture, it's different. It's not so much about the spatial dimension. Uh, or at least no, well, in any case, what I wanted to say is that I find it extremely interesting, the active search of, or for the vacuum, is one of the few artists who are absolutely coherent. Well, here's what I believe. What you said at the end, coherence, 
no matter who a day found or any other person are going to be coherent only if they are capable of abandoning what they have been. As if they were related with the famous spiritual exercises of Loyola in order to find the vacuum where everything is hosted. There is a mystic reason, but from a natural perspective, the law of change left him no other alternative because even the evolution of his work, you have seen very baroque shapes of his work um, brought him to the total elimination because vacuum can be defined when there's no matter around. And this is what I believe brought him to abandon the sculpture because he had done through or gone through the different exploration stages on the active vacuum, which has a theoretical interest also. Vacuum is constructed and they're emptying operations like in Henry Moore, where blocks are extracted. Well, all these artists came up with operations that could be understood as setting limits in order to put it in from a more architectonic perspective. And this is a physical event, not a theoretical event. Hence, my insistence in experimental processes, because the three authors were very much interested in experimentation in order to test their intellectual concerns. Out of the three of them, the most productive one was Otheza. Weisman has no theoretical corpus, and probably Lydia Clark, well, did not publish long texts. Uh, the other day, there's this double reflection theory is what enlightened the vacuum, which is in the pre-conscious. And I would say this could be understood as a turning point where one can find him or herself, where one can open a direct debate with your inner self, to put it some way. Of course, there are many objections to it, right? When we operate at an architectonic level, because of the other day, this was meant to be a chapel, and Montevideo's work hosted a library and an auditorium. So, yeah, well, I believe it's, it's extremely relevant to pay attention to function. And let me insist, function does not have to be canonic. It could be even said that the spiritual batteries that could colonize the landscape could be considered to be civic batteries with no religious connotations, yet confronting us against transcendental realities. And from this perspective, this has to do with the aspirations he aimed at when he identified himself with pre-Columbine artists who were religious, who were, let's say, the ones who would talk about the world with others, teach about the world to others, and who participated in a holistic take of the world. Would it come as the well, the active theoretical Landscape has a physical avatar, so to speak. And I believe that this brings us to operate in critical situations, not for having larger and more empty rooms. You will have a more active vacuum, I believe. The key is the function you insert in the vacuum. If you want to develop a true function, a transcendent function. We've seen it in different 
in different forums, right? If, well, you need the runway, the soul's runway oriented towards the Cantabric Ocean includes a vacuum that will make you face yourself before the landscape. So this active vacuum is also present in La Cargas in Ramon Casa, and I urge you all to revisit it in the upcoming days. I've done the exercise before sitting down here before you, and I discovered that there are many, many different forms of active vacuum. The key is the function that turns them into something which is alive, but the absence of shapes brings us to a deepest reflection, individual or joint reflection, and I would even dare saying that this is quite singular, quite peculiar. Uh, even if we're running almost out of time, perhaps we can listen to someone else. Oh, no more questions. We can leave it here with our spiritual batteries full of charge. We're going to call it a day. Of course, it's been very interesting. We could keep debating. But I believe it's the perfect time to stop. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Indeed.